Good evening, uh, members of the board and staff. Uh, I'm calling to uh, order the meeting of the Board of Directors of the Oakville Public Library for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Members of the board, uh, first of all, um, Jessica, any regrets this evening? We have no regrets. We have no regrets, but Pankage is going to be late. Okay, thank you. We look forward to Pankage's arrival. Members of the board, any declarations of pecuniary interest this evening? I see nobody, so let's move on. Um, I do want to acknowledge that uh, uh, Mr. Bright has indicated that he has a uh, best before time of nine o'clock, so we will do our best to uh, dispose of as much of the business as possible. I wouldn't mind being able to get out and watch the, uh, the American debates as well, so uh, no, I don't, sorry, I didn't mean as well. I'm assuming that uh, Stephen has something else up his sleeve, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why, Jeff, but I appreciate the, uh, your thinking of me. Yeah. Um, we have uh, six items on the uh, consent agenda. Before uh, we uh, discuss any of those matters, does anybody want to separate anything? Items one through six. Councillor Hazathiel, Janet. Um, uh, I have two, two things. One is I want to separate out number five, M, and on the minutes I have uh, one request. Okie dokie. Okay, so uh, I actually skipped the minutes, so let's go to minutes first, then we'll deal with the consent items. I apologize for that. Uh, so you got the floor, Janet? Um, so I would just like to make sure that there's a notation made that we had a discussion about uh, the term Indigenous uh, versus Indian status card. Um, uh, CEO Tara did a nice job of doing the research on it, but we had a fulsome discussion about it, and I think it should be noted um, in case somebody ever raises the question that, you know, or is this what we should be doing? Um, we did ask the question, and, and we we obviously got a, a fulsome answer. What item is that? Uh, what item is that? Do you uh, know that off the top of your heads? <laughs> I don't know anything off the top of my head anymore this week. It's kind of been one of those weeks. Yeah. Uh, it would be in the diversity... Oh, no. Uh, it was... It was in the membership policy, item number four. Jessica, is that something we can manage? Yes. Okay. So that has been noted um, at your request. Would you mind moving the minutes for me? Sure. Thank you. The minutes have been moved for approval. Anybody else have any uh, errors or omissions or questions or anything arising from the minutes? Okay, seeing none, I'll look for a seconder. Bill, thank you. I knew you were going to put your hand up. All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much. And sorry about that. Uh, okay, so consent items. We're going to be separating uh, item number five. I believe you requested, uh, Janet. Is that correct? That's correct. Can I get somebody to move items one, two, three, four, and six then, please? Susan and Stephen, since you want to get out of here at nine, why don't you second that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, for any last uh, comments, questions, separations on those items before I call the vote. All in favor? Thank you. So that uh, takes us through items one, two, three, four, and six, we have approved the staff recommendations, and I'm going to item number five, which is the employee retention and turnover metrics, and that was at the request of uh, Janet. Go ahead. Um, so um, I wanted to call out a couple things. One is I, re I really think it's great that there's an initiative that's going to introduce virtual recognition platform to support the staff, um, and um, great to hear, as well as the recognizing the long service. I'm wondering, in terms of the reporting, um, what we're getting is that, you know, retirement's and personal, um, and personal has a pretty broad range. Um, and I get that that is what um, Service Canada on an ROE might say, um, but some people's personal reason might be I moved out of town um, or I changed uh, careers, um, but it is, it is important to understand if it's something other than that. Um, and I'm wondering if it's possible to report um, beyond just a bucket of personal. 
Uh, yeah, we can definitely look at maybe some subcategories. We do have to be careful because um, we do have smaller numbers not to make them identifiable. Um, but at the same time, we can definitely have a conversation um, back and see if we can't create some slightly smaller buckets. And my last question, thank you for that. And my last question is, can you just confirm my understanding? Are we doing exit interviews yes. on individuals that leave the library? Everybody, yes. And what do we, and what do, we do with that data? Um, so that uh, data gets analyzed um, and then sent out. Uh, we review it, um, and then we, we act on anything that needs to be acted on. OK, thanks very much. Can I ask you to uh, move item number five for me, please, Janet? Sure. I'll Thank you. It. Sec seconded by. Don't all jump at the same time. Susan, thank you. Uh, last call for questions on item five. Comments? All in favor? All in favor? Hands, hands. Thank you. That's carried. We have no confidential consent items, and uh, we move on to our discussion agenda, and that starts with number seven. That's the 2021 Oakville Public Library operating budget. Uh, you taking us through that one? I am okay. indeed. I do have a short PowerPoint uh, presentation that sure. will come up. Did you send that link? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, thank you. Okay, so just a couple slides, because um, I know sometimes it can be hard uh, given the report. Um, there we go. Uh, so just highlighting the key facts that everybody will hopefully remember back in August, uh, we brought the budget driver report kind of indicating some of the key factors that were driving uh, the creation of the 2021 operating budget, uh, asked for feedback from the board. So we incorporated that feedback. Um, you'll remember also at the time that uh, we were tentatively looking at a 4.3 increase to maintain services. Um, the council, town council had given a mandate of 1.7 um, and the board gave us the direction to uh, meet that mandate. Um, so I'm pleased to bring forward a budget that comes in at 1.6. Um, so there was quite, signif uh, quite a significant amount of work that was done, um, both looking at a line by line review to see where we could find savings um, internally, looking at you know, five year projections where, where we could see some movement. Uh, but there was also a lot of work done around um, COVID and the assumptions around COVID and trying to balance some of that out. Um, we did know that we will have increased costs next year uh, related to things like cleaning. Um, however, we also know that uh, we're working with limited operating hours and we should expect that to continue through at least part of 2021. Um, so we did have to identify what were the key assumptions that we would have to work with uh, when building the 2021 budget. Um, so you can see in the, in the last key one, in order to stay within the uh, requested increase of 1.7, um, OPL will temporarily eliminate 4.4 full-time uh, employees uh, to bring where we were a 2.2 down to meet the 1.6 that was requested. Um, while necessary, uh, this move will impact OPL's ability to resume pre-COVID hours um, of operation. And I'll talk more about that, and that was also the reason that I included the operating hours report. Um, I also want to be clear that the 4.4, those are currently vacant positions. Uh, there is no um, staffing impact to staff that are currently working. Um, so just to highlight, we have capital impacts of just over 22,000. Um, one of this is, is a reduction uh, for the central one dex conversion that actually started, I think, uh, starts this week. Um, and then also an increase of just over 35,000 as a result of 16 mile branch. Uh, we put in a three year um, capital impact to increase our budget uh, for collections with the introduction of a new branch and that is what that reflects. We also have budget efficiencies of um, just over 9,000 which include uh, a 3,000 uh, reduction in professional development and skills. Um, Four point, uh, well, 4,300 uh, for mileage uh, and just over 
2000 for repairs and maintenance. Um, and a lot of those are looking at 2021 and expecting that in-person conferences and a lot of uh, staff training will happen uh, through webinars and there will be a, a decreased cost in that. Um, and mileage, we're just not traveling, we're not going for meetings, we're not traveling to different locations. Um, so that is OPL's actual piece of a whole Town of Oakville corporate initiative to reduce mileage for 2021. And then we have the temporary um, COVID impact. Some of these are plus and some of them are minus. Um, so we are going to gap a customer experience supervisor position for the first six months of 2020. Um, basically that is covering on maternity leave or not covering on maternity leave. Um, we do have part-time staff positions that we were temporarily eliminating for the year to provide savings of just over $200,000. Um, but this will have some impact on uh, operating hours. And as I mentioned, these are vacant. Um, the reductions in professional development and group training, uh, staff and volunteer recognition, uh, just totaling 26, five. Um, we are moving forward with, with staff and volunteer recognition through a different system. Um, and this is just not having in-person um, celebrations that we normally would, but taking it more online. So it's not that it's not happening, it's just happening in a different way. Uh, reductions in office supplies, um, instructor and performer fees that we normally uh, hire through programming, um, programming and meal expenses and collection expenses, um, we're seeing a reduction of about 12,000. Um, and all of the above really help manage and mitigate uh, the additional cleaning costs, as well as the decrease in revenue that we're expecting for 2021. I'm not gonna lie, anticipating the revenue for 2021 is challenging. Um, we're not sure what it will look like, so we, we went on the conservative side because we'd prefer um, to have a bit of a surplus than, than to have the opposite. So we're anticipating um, lower than uh, normal registration fees, room rental fees, and photocopier fees. And we reduced those by 50 and 40%. And then finally, fines and fees. So we uh, are recommending a 1.7 increase uh, for fees related to uh, programs and room rentals for 2021, which is in line with the direction from the town. Um, and also as part of the membership policy, we talked about this last month, um, that we are proposing the introduction of a $50 non-resident fee um, for customers who live and work outside of Oakville, um, but wish to access library services. Um, so anybody who lives, works, or goes to school in Oakville is eligible for a card um, as well as those in Halton as part of our reciprocal borrowing, except for digital products. And we talked about that last week, month as well, because um, that's a licensing issue with those vendors. Um, so if somebody lives, works, and goes to school in Burlington, but wants to access our digital products, they would have to pay. Um, and we're recommending this, this $50 uh, fee. It's looked at um, what our taxpayer pays for library services annually, um, as well as a comparison of what um, libraries in the region um, also uh, are charging for their uh, non-resident fee, and this is definitely in line with that. Um, so those are really the highlights of the operating budget, uh, and I am happy to answer any questions. And Catherine, I do believe, is on the line as well, if anybody has any broader town questions. Members of the board, any questions? Janet, did you, you were waving your hand. Do you have a question? Well, I was hoping someone else would go first this time, but I've given it a go. Well, you're the, you're um, the top left-hand corner of my okay. screen, so it makes sense. Uh, so um, I have a few questions. One is um, uh, there's savings that occurred this year. So just remind me because I'm, I'm just might be misremembering. All of the are any of the savings in 2020 allowed to go into reserves for um, library expenses in 2021? No, everything goes back to the town. Oh, but Catherine. Um, Catherine? I'll, I'll turn it over to Catherine. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought I could maybe explain it better. The library's budget is um, considered part of the town's overall budget. It's the same tax levy. So at the end of the day, whatever total surplus we have all goes back into the town's tax stabilization reserve. So um, 
I'm going to take my town councillor hat off and I'm going to make sure my library board uh, hat is on. So if there was expenditures between now and December 31st that would benefit 2021, um, are, are there any that you feel, Tara, would um, help you um, have them uh, help you in 2021? Are there any initiatives or programs? Yeah, and anything that we've identified that we should get done this year, uh, knowing what next year brings, we have implemented or, or will implement by the end of the year, for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, when I saw some reduction in, in, in skill development, I just, um, everybody's been working so hard to get up to speed in, uh, on digital and how to optimize digital. Are we short? cutting or short circuiting any of that necessary skill development because um, it, it seems to me that it, it can be a big learning curve for some. No, absolutely. In fact, what we're doing is the town has um, recently uh, acquired a uh, learning management system. So we're actually bringing some of that learning in-house and doing it ourselves. Um, so having our leaders and some of our staff create modules um, that then our staff will go through and then balancing that out with external training as needed. Um, so it is a reduction, but also um, because we're moving some of it in-house, uh, but also just a reflection of um, we're not necessarily doing um, some of the, the in-person classes. Uh, and it's actually been a really good balance so far because we can actually put more people in online courses than we might necessarily uh, send to an in-person. Um, but it is something we're very conscious of and we're, we're definitely committed uh, to our staff development and our training. So there is a reduction, but we shouldn't see an impact um, to staff overall. Um, and thank you for that. Um, the graphic designer and data database position, um, it, it's been empty. Is that, is that what I understood? It's vacant? Yeah, they've been vacant. Um, I do believe the uh, graphic designer from December of last year. Uh, and then the database coordinator was in Q, I think Q1 of this year. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and um, I guess my last question is just in terms of the initial discussions about strategy, um, you were working on this budget and then we had this initial discussion. Um, did you make any changes or shifts as a result of that preliminary discussion? Um, most of the shifts happened in capital given the direction that the board provided around the signage. So there was some shifting in capital and I'll talk about that next. Um, but in terms of operating, um, it was really just taking the board's direction to, to stay in line with town council direction and what we needed to be able to do that and balance out um, the needs of the community and how we can continue to deliver services throughout 2021 um, given the ever-changing nature of our current circumstances. Um, so my last question um, is around Clearview. So from an operating hours perspective, um, I saw the note that it needs to continue as is possibly for, for six months into 2021. Um, is that in the total budget of what's spent or is there flexibility to shift the hours based on the neighborhood's feedback? There is flexibility in the budget for us to, to shift the hours. Um, there's limited availability to increase the hours, if that makes okay. sense. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, did I see, and did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry, Colleen wanted to get a piece of this too. I just wanted to, to add on the, the Clearview one, any uh, location that is co-located with a school we have to watch very carefully because the schools, if they get outbreaks of COVID, um, will be shut down temporarily. So, which would require us probably to shut down as well because they they do our maintenance. So, uh, I I would caution us on in the short term on uh, changing operating hours that may be impacted by any closure. Uh, the, the schools are also using both the White Oaks uh, Library and the Clearview Library during the day, which does impact our ability to, to increase hours um, moving forward. Thank you. Uh, just a note to IT, uh, Colleen Bell is a commissioner of community services, not a board member, so perhaps you could uh, adjust the lower thirds that pop up under her so she doesn't uh, have to take... Um, any of the feedback from the public on board actions. Uh, anyway, I, Andrew, did you have your hand up for uh, as a question? 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, Tara, thank you very much, um, and Catherine, for preparing this. It's very clear, and I appreciate the, uh, the diligence and the effort and the clarity. Um, I do have a question about the non-resident fee. In your report on page 52, well, page six of your report, it's noted at $50, but in the appendix, it's noted at 55 I just wanted to determine which was accurate. Oh, that's my mistake. It's 55 Apologies. Okay. No worries. It's okay. That's great. Thanks very much. Thank that's thank the you. taxes. I forgot about the taxes. Further <laughs> questions? So I have one. Um, so I, I noted that you budgeted uh, revenue for room rentals. Uh, what have we, um, uh, what have we actually earned in room rentals uh, up to this point during COVID? Um, well, we haven't offered room rentals okay. um, to date. Yeah. Uh, so that is something that we were looking at um, potentially mid-year next year. It, it may not be unreasonable. Or, or actually, we, we were going to issue a survey right. um, to people who have frequently rented rooms for us to talk about what that could look like. What would they, they'd be looking for um, in 2021 and what they would be comfortable with. Because um, I think for us to start offering that should really be a conversation with them. Um, so I know that that work is is in process. Um, and once we get that, we'll have a better sense. I don't want to cause any challenges or any complications in your, in your budget preparations, but is it wise to even have a number in there for room rentals when it's A, not clear that's going to even be possible, and B, if you're going to be able to generate 50% of your normal revenue in what will be essentially 50% of the year based on, I guess, best case scenarios these days around when this is going to uh, ease up. Yeah, I mean, we had those conversations with finance uh, over the course of the past couple months about what that should be. Um, and it was decided that we really should put something in there um, to balance it out. We do expect uh, that we might be able to move forward with that in, you know, not early 2021, but, but not necessarily mid-2021. Right. Um, it's just really, it depends on some of the other things. There are, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a, a landfill, but we are hoping to start offering room rentals to some degree, maybe not to the, the, the size that we did, but smaller ones um, sooner rather than later. How would it impact your operating budget if you were to reduce that to 25% of normal revenue, just to be more realistic? Um, well, then uh, I, we could do it. I mean, we came in at 1.6. Yeah. Um, so I think if we added in the, what is it? And, and Catherine's probably more of a math I mind a lot than I am. It wouldn't be significant. Yeah. I think it would only be like under 10. Yeah. Um, so that would still keep us, it would be more like a 1.7. Right. Um, I'm looking to Catherine to say yes or, or no. But Catherine, do you have, a, do you have any sorry. feedback on that? <laughs> that makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't have the numbers in front of me. Sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> but it wouldn't—it um, wouldn't, it would wouldn't take us over really, our. Um, it wouldn't take us over our our um, target, correct? No, if the board wanted to, to no. approve a, a budget increase of one point seven, um, that would definitely cover that decrease. Okay, uh, Andrew, did I see your hand go back up? No. Okay. Um, members of the board, do you have any feelings about what I've raised one way or the other? I'm not wedded to it. I just don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to present a budget that's not realistic. And I don't think that expecting 50% revenue for room rentals is realistic. Um, I, I, from a, a point of view of just being, uh, practical, but also from my own professional experience on room rentals and, uh, facility rentals these days, I'm just, I think that's, it's, it's overly, overly optimistic. Any feedback? Yes, Bill? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you because even when they, you know, go back to starting to uh, to use the room rentals, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be apprehensive about right. uh, okay. doing it until probably 2022. Uh, I, I agree with you. Okay. Um, Janet, did you have a comment or you're just you're nodding you agree or? Nodding I agree. I think it's a wise, okay. let's under... That's under promised and over deliver. You know, those were the words that were going through my mind as I read that. I just, I don't want to be in a position where we promise 1.6 and we end up at 1.7 later on. So, um, okay. Any further questions on this? So can I propose that, um, that our, that the, that the uh, uh, operating budget be amended to reflect a 25% um, that the recommendation be the recommendation with the staff direction that the uh, budget be in, uh, adjusted to reflect 25% of, of uh, room rentals and that the uh, 
uh, budget increase uh, numbers be uh, amended as well. Okay. Okay. Colleen, any, any concerns about this? No, thank you. Okay. Members of the board, that's the proposal um, before you. Uh, I'm going to look, look for somebody to move that for me. That popular, eh? Okay, Councillor Hazathiel, Susan Finelli, all in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to um, item number eight. That's our uh, capital budget. Okay, I'm just going to pull up that. Well, it's the same presentation, just the next slides. Okay. Moving on to capital. Um, so we were given a uh, non-growth capital project cap of, of 270,000 to look at for 2021. Um, we brought the budget driver report for capital uh, in August. Um, we heard the board's feedback about the signage, so that was removed. Um, so what we are bringing forward um, are mostly deferred projects for this year that will have um, an impact. Um, so just to go through them, uh, the library's capital replacement, this is uh, money that was identified by facilities management at the town um, for improvements uh, to the facilities, 16 Mile Central, and I think there was another one um, in there just to keep them in good running order. Uh, the library and furniture budget, this is an annual budget, although we have reduced it uh, for 2021. Um, <clears throat> we have still kept it relatively high, not uh, what it was before, um, mostly because it also includes not only library furniture, but um, programming equipment. Uh, and as we continue to explore new ways to go virtual um, and new kind of um, uh, directions to take, I wanted to make sure that we had budget to support that. Uh, also aware that we are going into strategic planning um, and wanted to have some money to be able to, to action some items that might come out of uh, strategic planning and we could likely do that through uh, library furniture and equipment where applicable. Um, there is the vehicle for materials handling. Uh, that uh, is again was deferred um, and will result in roughly $30,000 uh, in efficiencies uh, moving forward once it's fully in place. Um, so that is a really important uh, and ties to our incubator libraries um, as our three OPL Express locations are currently at capacity for existing staffing without introducing a new model. Um, and the new model uh, that is most appropriate is, is part of uh, that vehicle project. Um, there's the library master plan update. So we have increased that. Um, it was 50,000. We've increased it to 25,000 in conjunction with the town's portion for the recreation and parks portion. Um, and that is indicative of increased, um, expected increased costs um, and the nature of doing high levels of public consultation in a COVID world. Um, so we increased that. Um, oh, you may have also seen, we also increased uh, the vehicle as well, and that was at the direction of fleet. Um, costs have just gone up, and that just reflects uh, the increased cost of the vehicle and the customization to shoot our purposes. Um, the incubator libraries, um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in my uh, OPL um, CEO update, because we launched Browse and Borrow at uh, two of our OPL Express locations today, um, and they look to be a significant success. So this would allow us to expand that to other areas in the town. Um, and then this one was not uh, there in August, um, although I think we spoke about it, and that's the Glen Abbey exterior renovation. Um, we did, I believe, talk about the fact that the Glen Abbey renovation that completed at the beginning of the year um, is roughly $80,000 under budget. Um, and given that the exterior renovation was originally in scope for that, um, we definitely wanted to bring that forward again as we think it's really important. It's an ideal space. I don't know if, if any of you recognize it. It's really underused. Um, and so having the opportunity to, to do something out there will allow us to potentially do some in-person programming um, in the spring and summer, again, depending on where we are um, in the pandemic circumstances. Um, so those are the capital projects that the library is proposing for 2021. Um, we do stay in the $270,000 envelope. 
Because um, again, uh, the Glen Abbey, um, we do not consider as part of that. We had discussions with finance. Uh, it kind of works as a, as a trade off with the money that we're putting back um, and the money we're requesting. So um, we're putting back, I think, roughly 800,000 um, and asking for uh, 321. Um, and that we worked with FCM to determine what, what that would kind of cover. Um, so yeah, happy to take questions on our capital budget. Thank you. Members of the board, questions um, on this budget? Pankage, go ahead. So th thanks, Tara. I also echo Andrew's comments earlier. Great job on the, the entire budget presentation. So the, the town gave you a non-growth recommendation target. Did they give you a growth recommendation target, or is that that's you know open? Uh, no, and I know Catherine has her hand up. We're really just told to, to stick with essential. <laughs> um, but I'm sure Catherine will be able to uh, articulate it better. Catherine? Okay. Sorry, I just thought I could uh, explain. So <laughs> the, the non-growth portion, as you're aware, gets funded all from um, town reserves and town sources. Uh, the growth portion gets funded from development charges. So as much as a uh, envelope was not given for growth projects, we do have what we do there is consider how much money is available in that development charge reserve, and then determine whether or not uh, the budget put forward is sustainable. Um, well, so, uh, Catherine, as, but, as you started talking, I had my I could have had a V eight moment, and I realized of course <laughs> that's right. So never mind my question. Yeah. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No other, worries. Thank you. Other members of the board? Okay. I have a quick question. So the um, the vehicle for materials handling, you said there's a $30,000 um, operating uh, efficiency uh, realization upon uh, acquiring the vehicle. What year is that in? Um, the full realization would be 2022 because right. um, it is unlikely we would uh, have that in place before mid-year of 2021. Some of that's just ordering the vehicle. Right. Um, so we would expect to see the full realization of that in 2022. And are, is, this, is this vehicle essential for the um, delivery of the uh, non-branch or the specialized services that you're proposing to operate? I'm seeing nod, nodding heads in the, in the gallery. Um, yeah, we couldn't move forward with okay. any new initiative without it. Okay. And just, I want to be clear just on, on what you said. I think I understand this. So the $321,000 for Glen Abbey uh, is not calculated in that non-growth target of $290,000, correct? Because it is previously allocated. Is that the reason? Yeah, we talked about this with finance and we agreed that, that we would kind of do them separately. Okay. And I'm hoping Catherine... We did have that conversation. <laughs> is that is that correct, Catherine? Because I'm just looking at the report, and the report says very clearly non-growth target, and just above it, we're exceeding the non-growth target by two hundred thousand dollars. So I'm just yeah. concerned about the optics of that, and and being clear with uh, the ratepayers. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, we can adjust the the table. Um, so as much as the departments were given the non-growth target, it was um, a target. They were also um, allowed to put forward projects that they also did see as a priority. Um, the reason being when coming up with the targets, um, the only way to really do that was look at average you know, um, budgets in prior years. And as you well know, sometimes when you take um, a, a look at across averages, it sometimes can um, dilute what the total priority need might be. So we did have a conversation that um, as much as a target was given, um, if we did find that the budget put forward was affordable because of other revenues, um, we are aware a lot of money was deferred and put back into reserve as well. So we did um, deem that that outdoor project was uh, viable and affordable. Okay. Well, that's a reasonable explanation. Can we just amend the report for posterity so that... Uh it's clear that uh, we're not exceeding the, um, just amend the table. Okay, we can um, amend the table. Because yep. of course this is, these, this is the record of our operations and I just don't like, I don't like the optics of, of looking like we're, yep. we are exceeding our allocation by $300,000, so. Uh, Catherine? I could maybe, I could maybe suggest that we, the envelope was more of an internal 
kind of target. I'm not sure that we need to publicize it. So maybe we could just take the target out and say it's a, within um, it's within affordable levels or something. Okay. Well, I'll leave I'll leave that to your discretion unless anybody else has any concerns. Um, and just leave it as staff direction, just for the sake of making sure the record is accurate. Um, uh, Jan, did I see your hand going up? Um, I had two questions. One is, um, is an electric um, uh, van that the fleet is recommending? Ooh, yeah, good question. No, it, no it's not. Um, I would have to check back with them. I, I, we, we basically met with them multiple times to talk about our needs and went with their recommendation. Um, I'm not sure what the fleet's plan is for electric vehicles, to be honest. Colleen might know more, but I don't know. Colleen, any ideas? They are looking at, at greening the fleet over the next five to 10 years. Uh, the main focus has been in transit, to be quite honest, because of the ISIP funding, uh, because electric vehicles are more expensive. We do have hybrids in um, in uh, fire, um, but I could certainly talk to Enrico about what the options are with respect to um, a gr more green option. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, what, and what maybe the issue is is um, availability of the type of vehicle that they want in a green option. So I'll find out. It's too bad Ford won't have produced one by then. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe they and, like, and maybe my only they like other, to roll uh, off the first was, one and uh, give it to us. Um, we may, on uh, on the recommendation and the key facts, just eliminate the line that says they also provided OPL with a recommended capital project gap. Um, and if you take that line out um, and adjust the chart, I think I think we solved um, what what uh, Jeff uh, Chair Noel has uh, suggested. Okay. Um, I don't believe we can edit the report once it's actually been published. Can we? Of course we can. So once an agenda is published to the website and out to the public, it's not our practice that we redo the agenda and republish it out. Um, our best option might be perhaps a memo that we could say was distributed to the board uh, with the changes that you would like to make to that report. So if you were to put together a memo, send it to the board and send it to me, we can publish that side by side to the agenda so that people can go back and see the changes that way. Okay. Would that work for the board? I'm fine with that. Um, uh, what do you think, Janet? Um, sure. I'm, I, uh, it's a procedural thing. I just, I, I just think when it shows up at up at town council, we should make sure it doesn't say that. Well, that's. that's I think that that memo needs to go pretty quickly. So just. Um, well, this this is not what would go to town council at all. Right, but just be on the record. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can do that. Our our colleagues do, um, you know. Read yes. These reports they're available and diligent, and you know it's uh, the public read them as well. So just just to be clear, just for yep. clarification, this is a, this is going to be a challenging year. So yeah, fair. I just want to make sure that we're dotting our eyes and crossing our t's. Um, anything further, members of the board? Okay, I'm seeing nothing. So um, can somebody give me a motion to approve the staff recommendation? And staff have noted the direction that's not required to be part of the motion. Uh, Bill and Andrew, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Okay, uh, number nine is the August 2020 year-to-date financial status indicators. Um, is do we? Do you require, do you require a report on this or is the report sufficient or do you require a presentation on this? No, I'm happy to take just questions on okay. this. Members of the board, any questions on num item number nine? Did we have a mover for eight? Yeah, the mover was Bill and seconded by Andrew. Okay, thank you. Geez, my memory's working well. Okay. <laughs> um, any, any questions on item number nine? Is there a burning desire to have a report or have a presentation or are we okay to approve it as is? Okay, I'll look for mover. Okay, Pankage and Susan, all in favor? That is received. Um, item number 10, operational hours. 
So I assume you're going to explain uh, the impacts that we just talked about in the operating in this one? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I wanted to provide a report to kind of give some context as well as some of the rationale um, that we've been using to kind of determine operational hours and how we will be doing that moving forward. Um, so this report just really highlights uh, where we're seeing um, traffic uh, in terms of uh, in the branches as well as uh, matching our pre-COVID to COVID hours um, and how we are looking to um, adjust those as needed moving forward. Um, so we are looking at uh, roughly a, a three month kind of um, run before we, we to implement new hours. Um, and that's kind of how we're, we're approaching the pandemic as, as a whole, really, is, is okay, we're gonna put this in place. Now, obviously things come up and we kind of adjust on the fly, but we are working on like a three month long-term planning uh, process. Um, so what we're looking at uh, currently is um, traffic, uh, different use patterns in the library. So where, how many people in an hour are using um, the self-checks? Um, how many people are coming in to use um, our computers, the photocopiers, all the different services to try and get a sense of what is the patterns of use within the facility and what time frames are those happening in, um, in order to try to determine, okay, is the um, current operational hours sufficient? Do they need to shift? Do they need to increase where possible? Um, so these are some of the questions uh, that we are asking currently um, and looking at uh, the different uh, statistics that, that again, we'll bring forward to, to the board. Um, but I do highlight, um, you know, that one of the things that we're currently looking at is, is a shift from, you know, 11 to seven to 10 to, to six. It's a relatively minor shift, um, but one that initial indicators are showing us may be worthwhile um, because we are seeing pretty significant traffic in the first hour and a half to two hours to opening um, with very little traffic after five. Um, and as it gets darker and it gets colder, um, I'm not expecting that to change. So it might make sense for us to open an hour earlier um, and close an hour earlier um, with that. Um, but if you do that, you're not netting out your, you're not reducing operating. It's, it's, it's the exact same. Yeah our envelope, we're just shifting okay. um, within uh, uh, a daily time frame. Um, <clears throat> we are seeing um, reduced traffic overall. So traffic isn't really driving us and telling us that, okay, we, we need to drastically increase hours. Um, you will notice um, that there actually are two different, and I was reviewing this, and uh, two different numbers. Um, and I forget what, what um, report it was in where I actually stated that we're seeing 30% of traffic in the library, and in this one it's 55. Um, and that's, they're both right, depending on where you're looking. So we did a comparison of our current hours to our previous hours in their totality. Um, so before COVID, we were open, you know, 333.5 hours, and now we're open 189. Um, so doing a direct comparison. And then we also did a comparison to, okay, we're open from 11.30 to 7, and comparing those exact hours okay. across. Um, so if you compare the, the two totalities, it's about a 30% traffic. Um, but if you're comparing the exact hours from one year to the next, it's about 55%. Um, so we are, we are looking at different ones to kind of see, you know, what stories each one tells, because they tell different stories. Um, so we are looking at, at that. Um, but I did want to bring this forward that we are continuing to look at operational hours. Um, there is some room, um, now that the board has approved the operational budget, we are currently have I think it's about 16 vacant positions, um, and that has caused us um, to not be able to increase, but now that the, this budget is approved, given um, where it goes to council, that will give us capacity to, to hire some staff and, and be able to expand um, some hours. It may not be across all libraries. Um, for example, uh, Glen Abbey tends to be the busiest. We're still seeing it take 30% of the whole traffic for the entire system, so it may make sense to open Glen Abbey on Monday. Um, so these are the things that we're looking at um, and we'll bring forward uh, to the board, but I just thought the board um, should know some of the, the logic that we're looking at and just what our thought process is around operational hours. So happy to take uh, questions, comments, concerns. Members of the board, questions, comments? Stephen? Well, uh, thanks very much. Um, 
I, I, you know, and I totally agree with the with, with the direction of where we're going here. And I th and I think it's great that it's based on metrics. You know, you've got footfall metrics. You can, if anyone's asking, you can you can show them that there's quantitative evidence to that, which I think is important because we want to serve the customers, but we want to do it in an efficient way. So I, I applaud you that. The, re the real reason I put my hand up was not only to say that, but when I went to go get the board package for our last time, I went to Glen Abbey, my local. I was completely distracted. I actually pulled in. I was so distracted. I wasn't not many people in the parking lot. It was, of course, closed shut <laughs> when I got there. But then the signage was there, and it was great. And I thought, aha, I probably should have known that, but it was great. So I totally understand, both as a customer and as a board member, why this is happening. And I just applaud you. You've got the stats in it. And I love the idea of the three-month um, carryover kind of thing because you know, things aren't frozen in time. You know, Premier Ford is dealing with something minute by minute. So I just, I just want to say that I totally agree with it. Further comments, questions? So um, I apologize if this is obtuse and maybe I missed it, but is the, the um, projected reduction in operating hours as a result of the operating budget, is that absorbed by the adjusted hours from the two uh, partner libraries at White Oaks and Clearview, or are you looking at additional? Uh, because I, as I said, or as I noted earlier, your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday hours, you're just shifting. So, like, where so where would you make up those hours? And I again, I apologize if I missed it. I'm not sure I understand the question. So, in in the budget, in the operating budget, you said in order to achieve um, uh, the the 1.6, now we made it 1.7. There would be a reduction of operating hours. No, what what, what I sorry, and uh, that's my fault. Um, what I said is that we will not be able to resume pre-COVID operating hours. Right. We still may be able to increase our current envelope of hours okay. within that okay. um, once the budget is approved. Because like I said, we have um, 16 vacant positions, half of which we will need to, to support the, the 2021 budget, okay. half of which we will then hire for and be able to support increased hours at some of the I branches. get it. Now that you say it, I, I am obtuse on that. I wasn't, okay. I wasn't listening enough, I guess. So I apologize. I, I fully understand where you're coming from now. Now, um, I did have one more question. So the the traffic, whether it's 30 or 57 percent, depending on the calculation method, are you seeing any trends as opposed to where we're going with traffic right now? Now that we are entering phase uh, wave two, wave one, second wave, wave two. Now that we're entering wave two in the darker, you know, earlier yeah. that sort of thing, are we seeing any? Are we seeing any any changes in uh, traffic flow? Um, some of the challenges that, that we've really faced is we've, we've really only have started looking at September, right? Because okay. July and August are yeah. next to impossible. September's really, we had five of our branches up for most of September. Um, Clearview and White Oaks only came up the 29th. Um, so it's really been the last couple weeks that we could actually get full data. So um, we are looking at it, but I don't, we haven't identified any trends right. yet. We just haven't had yet. that yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Last call to members of the board for questions on this item. Can I get a mover, please? Uh, Susan and seconded by Pankage. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number 11, the respectful conduct policy. The policy um, has been appended, and uh, where do we want to go with this? I can just speak to a couple of the, the, okay, the changes. Okay, sure. Why don't you give us an update? Um, so the board will remember back in August, uh, we brought the respectful conduct policy. Um, there were still some concerns with it. Uh, so we took that feedback. Um, the policy that we've brought back, we've expanded on the purpose statement um, and added details around expectations, which also included um, definitions. Uh, the effort in which is to really kind of solidify OPL's position of complete non-tolerance of any disrespectful um, conduct within the organization. Um, but again, happy to take questions and comments. We also included the procedures, which we, we don't normally do. Um, but given uh, you know, the, the nature of this policy, we felt maybe um, the board would benefit from, from reviewing that. Thank you. Um, Jan, I know you always hate being the first to speak, um, but did, this, this is something you've been um, interested in. I just wonder, do you have any comments on where we are today with this? Does anybody else want to go first? I, I tried. No? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so thank you very much for, for some of the changes, and I hope that the circulating of some examples um, gave um, some of the board members some perspective. 
um, on uh, options. Um, as much as I appreciate that this has improved, um, I, I, I would like to ask that we defer it for uh, one more review. Um, and here are some reasons why. Um, so um, there's a phrase, for example, and I don't think the boards should try and wordsmith this tonight, but there's a phrase in here that talks about always acting in an appropriate manner. You need to say what's appropriate. We need, we need to have clarity about respectful um, behavior and what is that, what is the, what is that in, in a policy statement. Um, one of the things that I was looking for is that when somebody reads this policy, they also know what's their fallback if this isn't occurring for me. Um, and so while the definitions are terrific and that addition, and I'm great to see that personal harassment and bullying is there, um, uh, but it doesn't speak to, so if this isn't happening for me, um, what's, what do I do? And while I know we have now another, the other procedure, um, the person who's looking at that doesn't know that by reading this document. Um, my other comment is that um, when I look at some of the other examples, um, uh, I, I do think that their language speaks more to what the power of what this document could be. So, you know, when I look at the Toronto Public Library, when they talk about the policy is to recognize the dignity and worth of every person, um, the library will not tolerate, ignore, or condone discrimination or harassment. I just think there's some language there that could be much more um, best in class than, um, which is, I think, what we strive to be. Um, so, um, Unfortunately, I only got a chance to look at this this afternoon, so I couldn't say can we make some changes before we uh, the board meeting tonight as an option. Um, so I would like to suggest that we defer one last time um, to make some uh, do some wordsmithing and clarification. Um, and my other comments are, um, while I'm really thankful that you attached um, the respectful conduct procedure. Um, I have serious questions about that procedure. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it needs work. Um, it doesn't reflect. Um, I mean, as an example, today you do not put in a policy, the first step in the process to ask the offender to stop his or her actions that are being viewed. You have to phrase it in a way that makes it so that they do not feel they have to do that in order to have their concerns heard. We used to do that all the time. Um, but what, what we've discovered over the years with, um, and what the, the new thinking is, and, and I support it, is it is very difficult for someone to speak up sometimes. And it's difficult even to speak to their supervisor um, in these sensitive situations. And so we have to frame things in a way that gives them a different alternative um, because this isn't a minor, oh, I, I didn't like, you know, I didn't like your tone of voice. Um, this, is, this is beyond that. And, um, and a lot of people don't say what's happening until it overwhelms their mental health or they decide to leave um, or there's a big blow up um, because enough's enough. Um, so um, with that said, those are my comments um, um, and they're, they're there for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Other members of the board? Sarah, do you have, a, do you have any comment on what you just heard? Um, yeah, I'd just like to clarify. Um, a couple things. Uh, so we can definitely flush out, um, you quoted uh, Toronto in particular, so we can take a look at that. Um, as for the, the not recognizing um, the procedure, uh, is that you would, you would like it referenced in here, like for next steps or, or something to actually direct them? We can do that. Um, can, we, can you repeat your first when you asked us to really um, flush out inappropriate behavior um so it's it so for example where it reads by always acting in an appropriate manner. manner so one option might be to say something like um always acting in a, a manner that is uh respectful 
um, and considerate of uh, other individuals and is in compliance with, you know, our, you know, our values, et cetera. So inappropriate, some people don't know what's inappropriate. I mean, the number of examples that are out there where people think, well, what's wrong with that? And it's like, like a lot's wrong with that. Right. So I, I think we have to be a little more clear. No, absolutely. We can make those three changes. Um, and yeah, the board doesn't necessarily approve procedures, but definitely happy to, to work with you a little bit on those. Um, and, and you know this, and I just want to reiterate to, to the board as well that, you know, having a respectful uh, conduct policy and procedures is very, very important. Um, but I also know how is it, training is also really important and the attitude of the leadership is also really important. Um, so whereas I, I, it's not reflected in here and it will be, um, I, I want to make it clear that, that we take it very seriously uh, and we do actively try to engage our staff one-on-one -on -one and give them opportunities, whether it's through the direct leadership or whatever path they feel most comfortable with. And, and I know that in my, in my emails out to staff, I ask them you know, to bring it forward to me or through a third party or even the union executive, however they feel most comfortable, but making sure that any concern that they have is brought to our attention because we, we want to fix it. Um, and I think that is also something that, that we're working hard on and, and we'll make sure this policy reflects that. Thank you. Thank um, you, and, 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 and in no way are my comments meant to reflect that you don't. Okay. Um, I just want a document that's living and breathing where we want to go um, and for the, for also for the future. Um, and, it, and it's a positive reinforcement for new people who join the team of expectation. Okay. Yep. Would you like to move a deferral then, um, Janet? Um, yes, I would. Okay. Um, so there's been a proposal to defer this uh, matter uh, until the next board meeting. I think that's adequate, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, would somebody like to second that deferral so we can uh, dispense of this today? Bill, thank you. You're becoming rapidly becoming my favorite, just so you know, Bill, <laughs> because you're constantly on the ball. <laughs> not that you're not, the rest of you are on the ball, but Bill does this particularly excellent on moving and seconding. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? <laughs> All in favor? And that's carried. Okay. Um, let's move on to item number 12. That's the Halton Information Providers HIP info update. So I Do am going to on the pass line? this over to Marcus. Is Marcus here? I am here. Oh, wow. Hi, Jeff. There's a voice from, from the ether. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. Uh, please proceed. Uh, there is a presentation as well. So we can, if we can get that up, that would be great. Um, so while we're waiting for the presentation, I just wanted to say hello and welcome. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. Second, uh, our, my second time in two months, so I feel like the guest <laughs> that never never leaves right now. <laughs> Well, you're always, you're always welcome, Marcus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge that I'm uh, at home and uh, I'm situated on Treaty 22 of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, of the credit uh, First Nation and uh, acknowledge uh, Chief LaForme's uh, stewardship of our land. So um, I wanted to talk to you about... Oh, I wanted to talk to you about and uh, give you uh, an update um, on how COVID has uh, affected um, and uh, enhance really uh, the Halton Community Services database and the information and referral and the community services data that we do at Halton Information Providers. So um, the information and referral sector was, is really built and supported, supported by community information. And so uh, what we do on our database with our fantastic staff and our, com our community partners and our library partners in our organization uh, is really one of the backbones to community information and the information and referral sector. So uh, crisis times, um, natural disasters, uh, community emergencies is our thing. We are here to uh, make sure that the, the right information gets into the right hands uh, and in a timely manner. So that's what we do and that's what we've done. Um, so you'll remember in, in January, we uh, launched uh, Halton Community Services Directory widget uh, that went out to the community and got a really great response. 
And then in March, COVID happened. So uh, taking a page from our regular widget, we created our COVID widget. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to show you some examples and uh, give you some stats on that. Next slide, please. So on our directory, um, you can, uh, similar to the regular widget, uh, we've offered the Healthy Community Services Directory COVID-19 Resources and Information widget. And so it is, again, a code, an HTML code that you just download or copy and download onto your website. And uh, it will, it will um, appear and get updated as we update records. It gets updated on a daily basis uh, at night. So we have um, places that we know uh, to mention a few are that have the, the COVID um, widget listed would be uh, the uh, Food for Life, Rock, Oak Hill Community Foundation, DAPT, Links to Care, uh, Oak Hill YMCA, Oak Hill Ready, uh, we have so the Holy Rosary Parish, HMC, Alton District Catholic School Board sent it out as well. And those are just to name a few, and those are the ones that we know, uh, agencies that we know have, have placed it on their website. So we're getting some really great comments and really great uh, positive response to it, uh, that agencies were scrambling themselves to support their clients and customers around openings and closings and, and how uh, different hours and services were opening or closing and reducing service. And so our widget, uh, that's what we do. And so our widget provided them with a really simple, easy uh, way of informing their clients and themselves. So next slide, please. This is our, um, on, our, on our main page, this is our alert. Uh, so generally there, if there's a heat alert or cold alert, we put something up uh, referencing where our, cold, our heating centers are and our cooling centers are. So right now it is uh, status that we have the COVID-19 resources information, uh, community resources listed as uh, one of our main um, alerts that you see on our front page. And then you'll, refer, you'll see to referring to the following listings for, for further information. We have then taken taking some of the um, community services data that we have already in our database and kind of broken it down into, into uh, sectors or into supports that uh, we followed very closely what's happening in the community and try to really make it quite accessible and easy for folks to uh, click on it and get the information. Uh, next slide, please. We also placed, uh, you can search by category on our database. And so this is, again, we placed a COVID-19 search uh, by category um, uh, pull down menu. And so what we're trying to do is, is get the COVID-19 information in as many places as we can on our uh, directory and in the community uh, so that people uh, can get the information quickly. Next slide. Uh, so these are the, uh, the records or the the categories that we have currently, and uh, these are the statistics that we hit, that we pulled. And so, in brackets on each uh, listing, that's the date that we launched it or started the the, the record. And uh, these are stats from so the first one community supports would be March 16th to September 30th. Uh, and so the, the record when you click on like community supports or information COVID information, it looks a little different in that it's not just one agency that appears. It would be um, it would be a listing of so community supports would have mental health supports and all of the mental health um, supports uh, places out there with their COVID um, information and uh, hours of operation whether they're closed or open. Uh, so it was always constantly being updated. So as as we would find out, uh, agencies changing or closing, uh, reopening their programs and services we would update those records. So it was a really quick, easy way for somebody to find a community support around mental health. They would see rock and, and, and as an example, and then hours of operation. And then as they, as the agencies started to open more, we continue to, to update that. Uh, and the, we chose these, whoop, let me just go back one sec, thanks. Uh, we chose these uh, categories uh, because this is what we were hearing from the community. Uh, and also from the province, uh, from uh, from our other partners, um, these are the things that people wanted to so were really looking for. So we're we're quite happy with our 25 or 23,000 views in, in short period of time. 
well used. Uh, Mark does a lot of the updating uh, of the COVID information, so that record gets updated daily as the province gives us, and, and the region and the town, uh, give us uh, stats and information on a daily basis, so that's an updated record every day. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So we also wanted to uh, get uh, get the COVID information out on Twitter. We use Twitter uh, for a while now, and um, it's a really great way to engage uh, folks. And so we, we tweeted out um, our COVID alert uh, to people, uh, to agencies, and tagged uh, a number of uh, agencies that are already in our database so they would know about it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just connecting community, connecting community, we did get a lot of retweets. Uh, so this is helping parents retweet, retweeting us. Uh, and it, again, we're getting a really great response in terms of uh, the information being accessible, being there, and being updated. Uh, and agencies are, are saying words like, we really trust the work that you do, and we really trust the information that, uh, is, that you're giving us on our, on our directory. Again, allevi alleviating some of that burden from other agencies trying to figure out uh, the rapidly changing uh, hours and programs and services happening during COVID. Uh, next slide, please. So here are a, a bit of a comparison of uh, our Twitter uh, account when COVID hit in March to September. Uh, and I compared it to, we didn't uh, have an opportunity to go back very far, but uh, from last year, on the right-hand side is 2009 statistics uh, against uh, the left-hand side, uh, some of our, our uh, increasing uh, statistics around uh, who's following us and twi tweeters, tweets, <laughs> uh, and links to our who's reading us, who's looking at us, uh, and uh, it's, that's on a dramatic increase and, and it's really being well used, uh, our Twitter account. We use it also uh, for the health and information providers. If we get a new program or service, we we will send it out on our Twitter and welcome the agency or the program to the health and community services database and link it to uh, link their record to to the tweet so that uh, there's there's lots of community engagement and, and agency engagement as well. Next slide. Uh, so Andrew is our tweeter, if that's a word, or twitterer, um, and he really does a really great job, and he uh, continues to send out information around COVID uh, continually. You'll see on this on this slide, there's a youth isolation activity record, and that was something that we were hearing that youth are getting bored, youth are getting, there's lots of mental health around youth and not being engaged, and so he's created uh, a record that will give uh, some youth um, opportunities and youth ideas around what to do during COVID and, and how to contact mental health agencies, that sort of thing. He's also pinned it, so it's all it's always uh, the first one. It's always very present so that people will see us all the time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, retweeting uh, is always very big, and so we have some, uh, some faces that we all know in the community who are very aware, and I chose uh, Pam, and uh, the next slide is Adam and Milton, uh, simply because they both, their offices uh, directly uh, engaged us and wanted um, wanted more information and wanted the, the links and, and, uh, and the, um, the widgets for their community. So that was pretty, uh, pretty great. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, like everybody uh, else in the world, uh, in March we purchased a Zoom account uh, so that we could continue to uh, to do the community engagement pieces. And uh, one of the activities that Andrew has uh, that Andrew did through March and April, and continues to, is offering a community check-in. So he is available 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday to Friday uh, to uh, update update people's records or listings with, if they want to give them new information. Uh, we did get a lot of uh, community individuals checking in with him around where his mental health um, um, supports that we could uh, access, uh, and then it became a, a couple of a couple of the um, the connecting live uh, really became agencies talking to agencies and really making connections with each other and how to support each other uh, because they had similar clients or they had a similar sector that they should be working uh, together. Uh, 
So there's a bit of a barrier here in that um, you, the process was um, that you would have to email us or call us to get uh, the Zoom information and the link for the next day. And so that was, we found that a bit of a barrier. So we'll continue to, um, to look at how we can improve that service, that new, that new services, that new service from the Healthy Community Services Directory. Um, we found it very, very, um, before we were live and on the internet and virtual, we would be uh, going to large community roundtables uh, and we would ask the leaders of that community table if we could have the Halton Community Services Directory live on, on a big screen uh, in a presentation while agencies did their updates. And so what we would do is, um, so if Rock was there and they were talking about a new program, we would pull up the Rock uh, Community Services Directory listing and, we, and Andrew could actually update it live in front of them. Uh, so that was a really great way to uh, to, uh, to keep our information um, alive and also uh, to keep uh, the agencies uh, connected and uh, and up to date. So we've had 40 uh, check-ins so far. Um, it goes in waves. Uh, we are getting uh, increasing um, people who see this and then they'll just call and Andrew can generally answer or email, uh, answer the, the question email or, or phone call. So again, there's lots of community engagement and lots of uh, community check-ins. Next slide, please. We also uh, took a look at um, Instagram, of course. And so we launched our Instagram account for health and information providers in December. Uh, we're currently at 514 followers. Uh, again, it's a really great way to uh, promote community uh, initiatives and community events that again, we will link back to uh, the agency record so that people will see it and then hopefully go onto the record and, and use our database and use our information uh, increasingly. So in the bottom, there's a couple of uh, examples. Um, that's our food bank on the left, our food shelf, which has now been reopened. Uh, and um, Food for Life is back with us on a weekly delivery uh, and offering food to our customers. Next slide, please. So we have uh, some really great partners in the libraries, uh, of course, for Burlington, Milton, and Halton Hills. This is Halton Hills. Um, and uh, during the COVID, uh, uh, start of the COVID pandemic, they had just made the decision to not publish uh, the community services listings in their community guide. Uh, instead, they chose to take out full page ads in that guide to promote the Halton Community Services Directory. And I believe I showed you uh, in January that, that an ad that, uh, that Halton Hills the town did for, for, for us. Uh, so they've since, uh, because of COVID, they've created um, uh, what they're calling the, uh, gosh, where is it? Their community support action team around COVID. And of course, you can see on their page now that we are front and center listed, listed there for uh, community resources. Uh, next slide. Also one of our editors in Halton Hills Library uh, did a little uh, YouTube video, um, again, getting started with the Halton Community Services Directory and promoting it. So it's a, it's a short eight minute uh, video about explaining who we are, how to use it, uh, and how we keep our information uh, updated. Next slide. So just looking um, currently um, at my desk, there are three, uh, a lot of our decks, but there are three that are, are pretty major for HIP at the moment. Uh, so we are hosting because we do lend out our, our um, Zoom account because we're not using it uh, as much as other people. So we are there to support community. And so we have a number of agencies that will uh, will use our, our account. Of course, we have to be the host and, and monitor that. Um, so we are for Inform Ontario uh, hosting, and I believe Tara mentioned this uh, last month, that we are hosting, there's four um, information referral education Zooms that we are hosting uh, for Inform Ontario, and Andrew is doing one uh, next week on Information and Referral Day. Uh, the second point is, I, as the president of Inform Ontario, um, and a board member for Inform Canada, uh, we really took a look at um, uh, both of those associations and where 
uh, what the struggles were, what our benefits of working together are, uh, and we were doing that work. And then again, COVID hit, and uh, our sort of thought was, you know, don't waste a crisis. <laughs> and so it really spurred spurred some conversation about uh, because the information in our referrals, so the work that we do at HIP and our database uh, into the community, uh, is really is critical for for these times. And so we both agencies or both associations are struggling with membership engagement uh, uh, and membership fees and all of those things. And so uh, I'm leading a conversation with both boards uh, and facilitated conversation around um, what do we look like as two associations? So do we continue to uh, be cooperative and work side by side? Um, there are just subtle differences uh, between us. Uh, do we work closer in collaboration, which, is, which we've already done, where we offer, um, again, more educational webinars to, for free for our members with, with bigger membership? Or is there an opportunity for combination, which would mean the dissolution of one or both of the associations and the new, a new uh, national um, information or referral uh, association be created? So that's been an ongoing conversation for about a year now. And... Um, and we're really we're working through lots of emotions and a lot of a lot of policy and a lot of uh, financial uh, pieces, uh, but I think it's going well, and I uh, I'm really proud to sort of lead that for the sector. So information and referral day, of course, is always on November the 16th, so that's coming up. Last year we held a community resource fair where we had um, 20 of our community partners come in with information booths uh, and we had about 150 residents uh, sort of filter through and learn about different agencies and different supports in the community. Of course, this year we need to be doing it uh, virtual. Uh, so Andrew is coming up with um, some ways for um, for the province, people in the province to, uh, to celebrate information or referral days. So that, that'll be coming up. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, this is a bit busy, um, but uh, it is an important uh, initiative that was just launched, or soft launched on the 19th. And this is really driven from uh, the Halton Region um, uh, Homelessness and Supportive Housing Department, uh, where there is this new app uh, through Ample App, or Ample Labs, sorry, called the Chalmers app. And it is um, an AI app that asks, asks questions and it spits up answers and resources for you. And so the region chose to um, engage with this company and uh, we're really, really insistent on uh, the company using HIP data and not 211 data. Um, the Chalmers app has been launched in other regions. Hamilton uh, was uh, two weeks ago and it's a direct, uh, it's a direct link with uh, Ontario 211 and not information Hamilton. But the region, because they're such an amazing partner of ours, uh, really, um, we're really very clear that they wanted HIP uh, and my staff involved with uh, providing and, and creating the data for this, this project. And so it is really uh, for, um, it's for the homeless and, and supportive housing uh, individuals and, and that, that department to be using. And so an individual will be able to have the Chalmers app and ask questions. I, I'm in Oakville, I'm homeless, I need mental health, I need a food bank, and then it will ask a couple more questions, and then the, the app will, will give you uh, Oak Park Neighborhood Center, Kerr Street Mission, uh, and directions and hours of operation and that sort of thing. So we've been working on this for with the region for uh, a number of months because there is um, some different coding on the back end to be able to match the app and their, their software. Uh, and so it is... Um, it is a small, uh, we were able to get a small uh, data contract out of it uh, because I don't believe in my staff doing anything for free anymore, <laughs> which they used to. Uh, and so they had a soft launch. It's going to be live on the 26th. They had a soft launch. And uh, Mark has spent a considerable amount of time with them in the last two weeks and will be until the 26th working out the bugs and the kinks that we're finding that they didn't know were even existing. Uh, so they had, we had 150 people on the Zoom uh, including uh, a couple of regional councillors, Mike and Jane. Uh, Mayor Burton was there. Of course, I couldn't see anything, so I'm just depending on <laughs> the uh, the host uh, being truthful and telling us who were there. 
uh, the Halton Regional Police uh, Chief was there. Um, Gary Carr sent uh, Gary Carr and CEO of the United Way sent a recorded welcome and, and thank you. And then Daryl, who is the manager of homelessness and supportive housing, did a really nice uh, shout out to HIP and the Oakville Public Library for leading uh, the health and information providers. So that, I thought that he, he just loves us so much, as, as does uh, John Gerslaus and, uh, and community engagement department there. So that was really great. Um, but I've got the links there. They just sent them to me. And when I went on, I was really hopeful, hopeful that I could show you all of the welcomes and the, and the props that HIP and OPL were getting. And when I when I viewed the um, the YouTube video, they just started at the actual demo of the app. <laughs> so I th and they said we forgot to press play or record. So anyway, it was uh, I was very proud. They were very complimentary uh, to my staff and to myself and to HIP and also to Oakville Public Library for for leading the project and spearheading that with, with the region. Uh, next slide. So the United Way has um, uh, a seed fund from seed funding from the Halton or the Trilling Foundation to look at and study or to, to assess whether or not social prescribing uh, is something that uh, they want to bring to Halton. It's happening in Halt in Hamilton, uh, being very successful. And of course, so as soon as I heard that um, people were talking about social prescribing. Which is a pathway to connect healthcare and social supports. So, as opposed to the doctor just writing a script, they also might want to be uh, recommending a gym or a yoga class, and that's a, or mental health, um, a mental health team to access. So, I immediately got on that bandwagon and said, if you're talking about that in Halton, the health and information providers, we need to be there uh, because we do this, right? We do social prescription, we do it in a, in a passive way, uh, but that's what we've been doing for the past 25 years with the director. So that would, we just had an initial conversation. Uh, again, there was there was a number of community agencies on the on the uh, on the Zoom who talked and were very complimentary about HIP and the information and that we should be using social prescribing using the HIP database. So that was uh, again really great. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Halton iParent is run by the Our Kids Network, and Our Kids Network, uh, if you don't know, has been uh, refocusing uh, their strategic plan to be more research and less uh, community-based, and so they have closed their uh, community hubs in our communities. And one of their other products, public-facing products, is the iParent uh, website, which has uh, been relatively successful in the community for a number of years. So when they uh, were taking a look at um, so they're trying to move out all of the services that were they were currently running into other agencies that they can continue. Uh, so they have just they have decided that um, certain parts of the Halton and I Parent are important for for parents, and that is again around the community services uh, that um, and child care in the child care sector. And so I had a conversation with Elena, uh, and so we are moving in the process of moving the I Parent. Uh, information over to the HIP database, and so we'll be hosting, hosting that. So it, what it'll look like likely will be, uh, if you remember, we have a, a seniors view and a youth view. We'll probably just create, we're still trying to decide what we're going to do, we'll, we'll create a child care view. Um, and so there's no additional work for us because the editor at um, MCRC or the THRC um, will be, will maintain those, maintain those records as part of our um, as part of our in, their in kind uh, contribution to our partnership, uh, there will be a small. I will be charging for like some of the work that we're doing in the creation of the. Of the so that's uh, another little small contract we have. Next slide. Uh, so on the other side of our desk, uh, we have Information Oakville, which is very Oakville focused, uh, and we. So we immediately when COVID hit, um, we were instructed uh, through our sector. Uh, to remove any paper, brochures, uh, posters, anything that people could touch, like high point touch areas. And so we immediately went online and uh, we created, um, we launched on May 1st uh, an information in, or info, sorry, information Oakville Instagram. And we chose Instagram uh, because it is the way to uh, create posters, like have people send us posters of events and fundraisers and community information that we can then post on 
on our Instagram for them. So it does. It is replacing the in branch posters and paper. Uh, it is something that was you know necessary. It's something that we are going to continue to to develop. Um, we are you know increasing our follow followers, and uh, of course we are working very closely with uh, Naveen and her team and in, in, and Joe's team and marketing and communications department. So we tweet and we Instagram and tag and back and forth each other all the time. So there's lots of really great uh, connections there. Too. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the uh, examples that Andrew has uh, has uh, captured. So there's Oprah Public Library, the services database, uh, and some of the events that we're um, we're always involved with. Next slide. Um, there's three other little tidbits that I want to show you. Um, this is Journey, uh, the Halton Regional um, uh, Service Dog, Halton Regional Police Service Dog, and uh, my staff Andrew is one of Journey's handlers. And so pre-COVID. Journey would often be in the Oakville Public Library and uh, taken around to staff for uh, some therapy and some petting and some uh, some goodwill and some good ways of, of getting through your day. Of course, Journey is in uh, isolation now, so Andrew does not have her anymore. Uh, but it, we do continue to do uh, Journey story times uh, and show and tell with Journey uh, virtually, so kids are invited to uh, sit with Journey for an hour and bring into the Zoom call something that makes them happy or something that makes them uh, it's getting them through COVID and, and the isolation pieces. Uh, and then they have lots of opportunities to ask Journey questions. Uh, in the middle, we have the Connect with HSPC, and that's the Halton Suicide Prevention Coalition, which I'm a, uh, a member of for the past 15 years. Last year, you'll remember we launched our Be Safe app at um, at our Woodside branch. Um, this year for National Prevention Suicide Day in September, uh, that uh, coalition uh, started a webcast uh, program. And so our first webcast was uh, this Suicide Prevention Day. Uh, and uh, Andrew, they use our, they use our uh, Zoom for the webcast where we can record things for them. And uh, Andrew then becomes the techie person as well as I do. Um, and so we have some guests. We had a, we had the chair, uh, the CEO of the Canadian uh, Crisis Centers as our first guest. We have Dr. Ian Daw from Trillian Health Partners coming up. Um, we have a survivor, a mother whose son uh, died by suicide uh, two years ago, and who worked at Sheridan College. Um, so there's, we have a, a roster of people that we'll be interviewing. It really is to maintain that conversation around suicide prevention, again, hosted by the health and information providers. And I'm sorry, the, the one on the uh, on, on little crest there is, it's, you can't really probably see it, but it is um, St. Paul's United Church in Oakville. And I've already reported back to uh, the commissioner and counselor, uh, Janet Heslett Neal, that um, uh, I was successful, or they were successful in becoming an affirming church through a request for, um, through, the, through us uh, to assist them. And so I was working with their youth uh, through the Oakville Public Library, and uh, on, on Sunday last week, they became uh, uh, an affirming church, which is uh, good, and they're down the street from us. Nice. And last slide. So a couple of coming coming events um, in partnership with the Halton Environmental Network. Uh, every year, we are involved with their HCC Reads campaign. This year, we have uh, the honor of Sheila Watt Coulter. The right to be cold author uh, who um, will be talking about she's doing a uh, uh, a, um, a talk she's filming a session for us uh, very specific to halton uh, about uh, her book and about what she's seeing the climate change that she, she's seeing in nunavut where she uh, lives and um i did a kochko interview with um, the ed of the halton environmental network just recently to promote the book and to promote uh, reading it. Uh, so it's a really great uh, way of getting people to read. So we're in the Let's Read stage. Uh, next, In the next week or two, we'll be Let's Talk, and that's, we'll be inviting people to to view the, um, uh, the session that she's going to provide to us on Kochko, presented by Kochko. Uh, that's November the... When is that? That's November the 9th. Uh, and then on November the 13th, uh, Children's Grief Symposium through the Lighthouse for Grieving Children. Uh, I'm presenting two sessions on understanding 2SLGBTQ 
uh, grief in the community uh, as a member of their, um, um, through the Oakville Public Library, a member of their, uh, uh, oh gosh, what do they call them? The, um, it's called PAC. It's an advisory council. It's a professional advisory council. And so we work with them to uh, make sure that uh, Oakville Public Library is staffed or, or stocked with uh, appropriate grief uh, materials for, uh, for them to use uh, in, their, in their programming. So that's our update. Um, however, uh, I do have uh, through the chair, if I ha have another moment to uh, update you on, a, on another issue that's just come to light on Tuesday that's not in my presentation. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So um, there's um, on Tuesday, uh, sure, one of our uh, supervisors and I uh, learned of the uh, death of one of our clients. Uh, and you might have seen in the newspapers um, articles around an unidentified male found dead or found with no vital signs uh, under the Kerr Street Bridge. Uh, and so we knew him. His name was Greg. Uh, he was a longtime uh, member and uh, user of the library uh, for over 10 years. And uh, so we just thought we needed to do something and, and talk about him a little bit. Uh, and because he's not an unidentified ma male to us. Uh, he's a member of our local public library family. And he really felt like he was, that we were his family. So Shirley and I asked very briefly if, if some of the staff who knew him would, would send us some, some thoughts about, about our friend. And so I'm just going to read a couple of things that uh, I really want to uh, put out into the world in, in memory of him. So we were, I'm getting things like Greg was a very quiet, mild-mannered man, a gentleman. He's been coming to the Central Library for a very long time, over 10 years. He would be there waiting for the doors to open in all weather and one of the last to leave when doors closed at night. Greg was a father and a brother and a friend. He had a group of friends here at Central Library that they met daily. He was a regular user of our food shelf and other customers would sometimes bring him food just for him. One person said, the one thing that stood out more than anything else was Greg's passion for the library and space it provided. He was a lover of books and would sit and read for hours and hours. Even during the even during our closure, sometimes when I would come into the library for work, I would see him sitting outside on the Navy Street bench uh, reading. It was like he had to be close to his home, even though our doors were closed to him. So George, or sorry, Greg was a wonderful person who managed the best that he could. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, um, lived with homelessness uh, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we recognized uh, his contribution to our library and uh, and his contribution our contribution to his life uh, and I think it's a really great example of, of um, those populations that library serves and um, is um, honored to serve thank you for indulging me in that Thank you very much. Um, getting some feedback. There we go. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was a very complete report, and uh, our condolences to uh, all of the uh, friends and family of uh, of Greg and his passing. And uh, you uh, you did him a great service by uh, uh, bringing uh, his name and his story to uh, to the board. So thank you for that. Members of the board, are there any questions uh, for Marcus on his uh, report? Seeing on a look for a motion to uh, um, receive the report, I'm just double checking that it's a receipt. Uh, can I get that, please? Uh, Janet and Susan, all in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. Great job. We always look forward to you. hearing about Thank your you, adventures. That was very thoughtful to add that name. Thank you very much. I'm very, I didn't. I didn't know the story. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. It's um, our staff are, are quite affected, and I've been hearing like for days now, like really amazing stories about about their interactions with them. So, well, please let his friends at the library know that uh, um, their board are uh, are um, thinking about him as well. Uh, members, thank of the, you. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, we let's move to item number thirteen. That's the website update. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Th thank you very much, Marcus. That was, that was amazing. Um, yes, moving on to the website update. So there's uh, been a few months since the last update, so I decided to put a bit more background uh, within the report. Uh, since we've last spoke about it um, on, so major milestones that have hit on September 19th, we formally issued the new RFP for the, for the website. As we spoke about last time, this, is the, this was in the form of a limited tender, which had our IS department literally scrub the landscape of developers. Found, we found the best gold standard of vendors, which we personally invited to this RFP. Uh, we're currently in the, in the RFP process. Uh, yesterday, we just had the post-review meeting, which allowed uh, all of these vendors to actually have access to the existing code, the existing website, and so forth, to get a full picture of what they'll be working on. We've been, I mean, sending back and forth with questions, putting it through. Uh, next milestones, which are upcoming, would be um, tomorrow actually is the last day for any of these uh, vendors that are remaining to provide us any questions and for us to provide them back with answers. Next week, we'll conclude the RFP process where all the bids are requested to be in. And in the first week of November, we will look to actually review uh, the OPL project team that in also includes IS and purchasing and so forth. We'll actually review all of these vendors and their proposals on the first week of November, which we will then pick our next vendor to move forward with. Um, if everything goes according to plan and the vendor it can actually begin work right away in November, potentially the beginning of December, uh, we estimate that, I mean, with working hit or miss over Christmas, it would probably take a new vendor three to four months to complete, which will bring us into hopefully spring until the launch of the new website. So I open it up to the board for any potential questions regarding the website. Thank you for that report. Members of the board, any questions on this uh, report? I don't see any questions. We look forward to uh, more progress reports as you go forward. Thank you. Uh, if there's uh, any epiphanies, would you mind sending a memo to the board members? Absolutely. Uh, before the next board meeting, because I know that everybody uh, on the board is anxious to uh, get this project moving forward. Yes. Probably second next to you. Oh, a <laughs> few people of IS, uh, at IS too. Yeah. But yes, okay. we all are. Thanks, Joe. Thank uh, you. Any, uh, any uh, further, uh, one last call for questions. Look for a motion to receive the report. Janet and Susan, that famous vaudeville team, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. You. Uh, last matter of business uh, today is our CEO report. And uh, how, how long is your CEO report? I can make it go. No, no, I just, it, it, I don't want you to make it. I don't want you to be fast. I just try to determine if we declare a quick three minute bio break or whether. Uh... It's not longer than five okay, or six then minutes. Okay, let's go. Okay. Okay. Okay, so just some quick um, COVID-19 updates. Uh, Halton remains in stage three. However, um, with the rising cases, I thought it pertinent to reach out to those libraries that have moved into the modified stage two, such as Mississauga, um, Toronto, et cetera. So I had a conversation with them uh, basically to see what impact the modified stage two has had on them, and it's had no impact on them. Um, so that is good for us, um, that if Halton does move into a stage two, um, we do not anticipate any uh, significant changes to our current services. Not that we're trying to jinx it. No, no. not at all, <laughs> not at all. Um, the town EOC uh, me is now meeting, um, so that's the Emergency Operations um, Committee. Uh, has increased, so now we're meeting five days a week. Um, we introduced uh, Grab and Go, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but people are really excited. It, it prevents them, allows them not to necessarily have to come in and browse, but just grab basically a, a bag and go. Um, we're expanding our face shield options. Um, we did issue face shields. We got some concerns from staff about how they fit different face shields. So um, we're looking at some different options to, to kind of allow them um, that extra level if they wish. Um, and we're testing new hand sanitization stations um, at some locations. When, when you, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, interrupt, but when you are, um, when staff are using face shields, they're still using masks. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Terrific, okay. Yeah. Uh, so today we launched uh, Browse and Borrow kiosks at QEP and St. Luke's. That also launches OPL Express at those locations as well. It had previously been open at 16 Mile. Um, so now all three of them are open. Um, I updated this uh, 
photo at, I think, shortly after six, because um, these people were waiting to access the kiosk um, at St. Luke's. Um, they somehow heard that it was launching, uh, and they waited patiently, and they were the first ones in, and were very, very excited about it. So that was exciting to see, and we're looking forward uh, to seeing how the community responds to the Browse and Borrow kiosks in addition to the lockers. Uh, and then we have the grab and go bags, um, and they have also been really well received. Uh, we have them in numerous different categories, uh, picture books, first chapter books, nonfiction, fiction uh, for different age groups. So parents can just come in, um, grab the bag uh, in the category that they want, and it's a little bit of a surprise bag um, for the kids at home. And, and uh, if you follow that um, Instagram uh, post or, or Facebook post, uh, people are really, really liking it. Um, we posted it and a lot of people were like, just went out and got one and it was really exciting to see that kind of almost instant uh, feedback. Uh, and then we also, this being Ontario Library Week, um, announced the permanent elimination of overdue fines, and the response to that has been amazing as well. We've been very, very pleased. Um, it's also really interesting uh, to know that um, there's a lot of calls to other municipalities and other libraries to follow suit. Uh, so Burlington gets called out, although they've actually done it. Um, Mississauga gets called out, uh, and they haven't done it. Um, UNB Libraries also gets called out. So it's kind of interesting to see that, that you know, not only is it our own customers, but other people are, are calling out um, uh, libraries in their neighborhoods to, to follow suit. So that's been amazing. We've gotten some really great feedback for that. Uh, Marcus touched on this really briefly. So we've, we're expanding the food shelf at Central. Um, I think I may have mentioned this, that we're adding a fridge um, to go along with uh, the shelf that offers dry staple goods. Um, and we're reorganizing that whole uh, area. Um, and Marcus uh, is working with uh, the town to potentially um, have an artist come in and do uh, some kind of artwork in that space as well. Um, so looking forward to bringing that to the board as it develops. Uh, summer reading, um, just to pull it a little bit out of, of the stats report that went in consent, um, Oakville's big summer game scavenger hunt was successful with 56 different participants um, operating over the summer with uh, different activities. Um, we had a total of 485 active readers registered, children, teens, and adults. Um, Glen Abbey had the highest. Um, and then we had a bunch of really great programs. Uh, Dogman versus Captain Underpants, <laughs> definitely would pay to see that one. Um, Harry Potter trivia Quidditch, uh, Lady Lunch, Lunch Lady Games, and, and Pig the Winner. Um, so definitely uh, a de successful summer reading. Wasn't exactly what we had planned, but I think uh, in the end it worked out really well. Um, we're launching, uh, we're have hosting a, a staff pumpkin carving contest in an effort to bring some fun uh, to staff. Um, so I do actually have a question because uh, myself, Joe, and Simona are all participating. Um, so we cannot judge. Um, so we are asking if the board would be interested in potentially judging our pumpkin contest. Um, it closes on the 26th um, on Monday. So on Tuesday, if the board is willing, I will send them out and the board can, can vote on the winners, which we will then post on social if they're okay. I think that's an awesome idea. Anybody it's going to be fun. We're looking forward disagree? to it. Anybody disagree? Nope, I don't see a disagreement. Okay, good. Although I can't see Pankage. Oh. <laughs> it, it's an awesome idea, but kind of scary. <laughs> I'm really excited to see the creativity. My creativity is pretty simple, okay. but, but we'll see. Um, and then we have a bunch of Halloween activities. Yeah, I we, think you're, you're trying to basically set the bar low. Set so the that, bar that real low. Win. I get it. Okay. Low. <laughs> Um, we have different fan clubs for, for some different things. Uh, we got the make and take, the spooky mobile, uh, and then we've got some costume parties. Um, I sent the board a, a, a sneak peek at the spooky family story time special on Monday. Um, we're really pleased with uh, how that's turning out and excited to get that out to the public and, and see the response. Uh, we're also this week launched the Glen Abbey Study Hall. So we are aware that with COVID-19, space has become a premium, in particular for students and not having it to study. Um, normally, you would come in to just about any of our branch after 3 o'clock, and it would be wall-to-wall -wall students studying. Um, and, and now they just don't have the ability to do that. So recognizing that, we're, we're working with the Glen Abbey Community Center and have opened up a study hall space in one of uh, the community rooms. It's the one that actually is between the community center and the library. Um, and it, it'll be jointly supported. Um, it'll be Wednesdays and Thursdays. There'll be two different sessions. Um, 
they'll be in for 90 minutes and then with 30 minutes cleaning in between uh, and we'll see how that goes uh, and then uh, go from there. Lean certificates, um, I'm just really proud of the staff, so I wanted to, to highlight that. The Town of Oakville has been offering a staff certification courses in Lean, and, and our staff has been taking advantage of that. Um, so Danica Bernard, the Manager of Programming Development, um, just received her Green Belt uh, certification and did her project on um, introducing virtual programs in the time of COVID, so it, it, it turned out really well. Uh, Lisa Williams um, is about to get her yellow belt and she did her project on um, donations. Janet, on, on you'll be pleased with this, on how to speed up the processing of donations. Um, so she took a, a great look at that and there's some significant improvements that will come when we start uh, accepting donations again. Um, and then Chrissy Snyder, um, who's our technology specialist. Um, in September, we brought to the board a, a report on RF. ID, um, and in particular, we spoke to some of the challenges we've had with that. So her project was actually on streamlining um, some of the RFID processes and, and basically how to keep them, be proactive um, with the different sorters uh, and get them up and running and keep them up and running. Um, so those are three projects that are definitely paying off. Um, and then there is a new intake going in in November, and we're pleased to have three um, staff who have stepped forward wanting to explore their yellow belt um, so the manager of White Oaks, uh, the supervisor at 16 Mile, um, and then Olivia Harris, who's the, the new supervisor up at Clearview. Um, so we're excited to see what projects they identify. Make sure you let the uh, Danica, Chrissy, and um, you change the slide. Lisa? Oh, sorry, Lisa. Lisa, Chrissy, and Danica, let them know that their board congratulates them on their initiatives. Absolutely. And then it is public, uh, Ontario Public Library Week. Uh, we always uh, thank our public, um, but we also thank our staff. Uh, last year, the board will remember that, and I noticed Susan had it, um, we gave out our OPL mugs. Um, this year, for those of you who picked up your bag, we gave out uh, OPL journals for staff. Um, the staff were, uh, ones were a little bit different than the ones that the board received in that we, we put in um, a card. It looks like, it looks like the old fashioned um, due date cards, just highlighting what they could do with the journal. It could be a gratitude journal, it could be a, a recipe journal, it could be whatever they, they needed it to be, whatever brought them joy. It um, could cause PTSD to some people like my age. <laughs> um, oh, by and the way, just for fairness, Andrew also had one of the OPL mugs I noticed. Oh, okay. Um, and then we also there passed along uh, the board's <laughs> thanks to staff. Oh, Janet too, there we go. Oh. Um, and I also want to take the opportunity uh, as we do to, to thank the board. Um, you are a volunteer board and we appreciate you taking the time and I know the staff and all our customers appreciate that as well. Um, so normally we would get to do this in person with all of you, but that is not the year. So uh, my thanks to each of you. And then finally, um, just a reminder that our next strategic planning session is November 5th. I do have uh, the notes that uh, Glenn took. Um, I'm just giving them, uh, he wanted me just to review them. I will probably send them out to the board next week. Um, he asks that, and I'll, I'll say this in the email, he asks that you know you kind of review them. Um, he will ask at the beginning of the next session if you have anything you want to add to them. So, so feel free to make note of that because he'll ask for that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the board had also asked for a couple other things as part of that, and those will come out. Um, and then the final thing is I am off Friday and Monday, um, so the board's update will go out on Tuesday next week. Fair enough. Um, and happy to take any questions on any of that. Questions, board members? I can't see I have every, a question. I can't see everybody. Oh, there we go. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so um, you remember that um, that annual event, so I thought it was annual anyway, you guys used to have at the Oakville Center and the staff would do reviews of uh, their favorite books and all that. Are, are you guys doing that virtually this year or have you thought about it or? Oh, it's tonight. Um, it's tonight. <laughs> Well, we did. It's, it's a bit of a different version. It's called Library Loves, and it was at started at seven tonight. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And um, it was really library staff presenting what they love most about the library, their favorite books, um, oh, and okay. such like that. I do believe. Do we record it and post it? Yeah, we'll record it and post it. I'll I'll include. I'll, I'll send out the link um, to okay. to the board. Great. Any other comments, questions? Janet. I just wanted to say uh, what one of the things I loved about your update this time was talking about some of the projects that the staff did uh, on lean. I just I found that really yeah. like 
heartening that they not only are learning, but they're applying it. Um, so thank you for including it. I just, I thought that it really, I, 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 I was really impressed at how, what they chose. And, and um, so keep doing that. No, absolutely. No, we're really proud of them. Um, I just want to comment, you brought up the strategic planning session. I just want to thank the board members for their participation mm -hmm. at the strategic plan part one. I think that uh, the session was amazing. I can't wait to read the notes, and uh, I, I really felt very good about um, the day's uh, uh, investment and some of the, uh, uh, the ideas we had, and uh, I, I think this is, we're off to a really great start um, to uh, continue to build our library into the future. So thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day, and I look forward to working with you all again on the 5th. And if Glenn's watching, you did a great job uh, facilitating for us. Um, members of the board, uh, I need a motion to receive uh, the CEO update, please. Uh, Stephen and Susan, all in favor? That report is received. Members of the board, I'm sorry to tell you that that was the last item on the agenda tonight. I know that uh, you were budgeting much more time for this meeting, but uh, we were very efficient. I would imagine that would qualify us all for lean yellow belts. <laughs> um, there are no confidential discussion items. Uh, is there any new business to come before the board tonight? See none. I will move on to remind you that uh, the next board meeting is on Thursday, November 26, 2020. It's a virtual meeting at 7 p.m. And uh, I'm looking for motion to adjourn. Uh, Janet and Susan, all in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, team. Thank you, staff. And uh, have a great month and happy Halloween. There you go. <laughs> I was like, oh, we almost timed that perfectly, Stephen. Thank you all. Good night, all. Thank you.